This is Movie Tone, Leslie Mitchell reporting. Well, here she is, Jaguar's new speedster for 1961. They're calling her the E-Type. This is the car that, more than any other, will be identified with the swinging 60s. The car that everybody who is anybody will drive. Peter Sellers, Twiggy, the Beatles, George Harrison. This is the Jaguar that will take America by storm. And watch out, Mrs. Jennings. Your husband will want one of these. Britain was a remarkably old-fashioned country in 1961. You have to remember that was the time when steam locomotives still pulled express trains throughout the country, when turboprop airliners were still being built to take you, you know, across to Europe and America. It was a land where not many people had fridges and telephones and so on. It's deeply old-fashioned, a place of sports jackets and hats and cigarettes. You don't think that when you look at the E-Type, of course. The E-Type was so sensational because it seemed to blow away the cobwebs of that older society. why the Jaguar E-Type really captured the imagination, I think, is basically because the styling fitted the new concept of femininity, the new e image of what a woman should look like. This was well beyond the days of Jane Mansfield and big bosoms and points and, and so on. And here we have something which is sleek and slender, almost understated, and that was the image of the woman in the 60s, which has persisted to a large extent into the 1990s, which might help to account for the way the E-Type in particular has retained that very special mystique. The reason that the E-Type was so popular was partly that it was also an accessible dream. It wasn't priced that high, and people could imagine actually one day being able to buy it. It was rather like it was possible to go out and buy a modern camera at the time and imagine you were one of the new photographers like David Bailey, or that the girl, if you were the girl next door, you could become a model like Twiggy or Jean Shrimpton. It was realisable, it wasn't too expensive, and it had something in it that appeals to everybody. I got no car and it's breaking my heart. There are many people who think of the E-Type as phallic, and sure, it, it's phallic. But to see it as just a phallus is really to engage in a rather sort of amateur psychoanalysis, which has come to predominate a lot of the debate about um, the E-Type. What people forget about the E-Type, and really cars in general, that they are hermaphroditic. They have both masculine qualities, not just the long phallic extension, but also the symbolism of pistons going in and out, and clutches, and fluidity, and virility, and power, and so on. And they also, on top of that, have very feminine characteristics as well, shown very nicely in the E-Type. Those curves, the sort of grace, the style, the elegance which goes with it, is very evocative of, of a feminine kind of image. And I think that's part of the enigma of cars, and particularly of cars like the E-Type, that they do have this dual sexuality, this dual symbolism. You always imagine somehow that some glossy Italian in a very sharp suit designed it. It came from one of those lovely styling studios in Milan. It didn't, of course. It was designed, the actual shape came from Malcolm Sayre, the aerodynamicist and engineer. He was um, a real academic buff. He walked around, a big tall man, tweed jacket, quite portly, greased back hair. He didn't look like the sort of person that designs the sexiest car of the 60s. 
But for all that, of course, he knew that aerodynamic forms, or as close as he could approximate to those forms, would lead to something beautiful. He did it with the D-type in the early 50s, and he did it again with the E-type in 61. I always refer to him as the gentle giant. Yes, well, those were very happy days uh, developing the D-type, and uh, of course, you know, it's uh, very successful in the racing field. But uh, in our minds, uh, with Jaguar, there was the fact that possibly the D could be uh, developed into um, a road sports car with a very good high performance value and uh, be very competitive against anything that was on the market. The D-type did start the fruits and thoughts of producing a, a sports car which could be sold to the public and uh, it evolved that we produced the E-type. We used to use the M1 for doing the maximum speed test. Very often we would be doing 150 and other cars were there as well at, at doing very high speeds, uh, the Aston Martins and uh, other firms. It was a very useful place to uh, do maximum speeds. The cars had been creeping around the factory, the prototypes and so on. Everybody had glimpsed them. There was a general veil of secrecy over any new cars, uh, and this made it all the more exciting. But the M1 motorway had recently been opened, and the rumour was always, Norman's just done 150 miles an hour on the motorway, or just got from London in 40 minutes, or whatever and it all built up to be something really rather special. We began uh, 1957 uh, with E1A, which was the first prototype, which did the development work prior to the E-type. But um, there was mixed feelings as to just how far we want to go with the car. Further drawings and investigation proved that it could be made into a real good sports car. And I, I felt we had the potential there anyway uh, of being a very good sports car. Sir William Lyons, the managing director, chairman of Jaguar, he was unsure about it. He really wanted to concentrate on big, fast, medium-sized saloons, of which he was very good at and which were very profitable. The type had a question mark hanging over it all the time. Would it be a profitable car? But when it got near to production, and Lyons thought it was a good idea after all, he came in and gave it his wonderful, undivided attention, putting in all those little details, badges, switches, chrome strips, nice use of leather and so on, that gave the car the showroom appeal, that lifted it from being a little boffin's experimental racer into this glamorous, sexy star.
Sir William Lyons was, of course, a remarkable man. Uh, uh, autocratic in many ways, but uh, had this fantastic talent for both artistry in car design and, and marketing, knowing what customers wanted. Um, he brought the company up over a, in a very short period, really, and turned out some remarkable motor cars. William Lyons had a very sort of, I suppose, special relationship with a, with a few journalists that he knew. And what he'd do with them is invite them in for a look at the E-Type in its development stages. I mean, they'd get a chance to sort of sit in it, um, look at the drawings, look at three development stages maybe. And what it did to other journalists was make them even more eager to find out what the privileged few were having a look at. The actual privileged few then would be writing gloriously about this new car that was up and coming. Um, this can only be described in modern terms as the classic advertising teaser campaign, which is a few people know about it, a few people get ex access to it, and everybody else really wants to know about it. The E-Type was launched at the Geneva Motor Show in 1961, and Sir William Lyons chose that show because it was the most glamorous one in Europe. He didn't want to launch the car in Britain because he didn't want to associate it with blimpish, rugged, open-top British sports cars that had a very primitive appeal. The E-Type was going to be a great continental tourer as well as a very fast sports car. The funny thing about the Geneva show was that when the car arrived, it was crated up in a big box, or a big box covered it, so you couldn't see it. And the journalists were all waiting, and the public the next few days, what is this thing in the box? And when the box was lifted, there was this glistening, beautiful, sexy sports car, but standing on this threadbare Persian carpet. So you had this rather lovely idea that here was the greatest new car since, you know, God knows what, the first sports car to run, sitting on this rather raggedy carpet. Very British, lovely British feel to it. I had the fortune to be at uh, that October motor show at Earl's Court that year. So it was the first UK motor show which the car had appeared. And we were besieged uh, in our little store where we handed out the leaflets and so on. Uh, we were trapped. The crowds surged around the thing and uh, would stay. It wasn't a matter of people coming and going. The throng got bigger. Uh, it, it was a great sensation. Nine six double HP is probably the most famous E-type of all. The reason for that is that this was the car that Jaguar used to get its maximum speed test runs. It took the car out onto a Belgian motorway and shot it along at a genuine 150 miles an hour. And it was that speed that captured the public imagination and of the motoring press. But of course, something that nobody knew at the time, well, the press knew but they weren't letting on, was the fact that 9600 HP had been specially doctored and lightened to get to that top speed. The production cars wouldn't quite do it. But Jaguar was learning, well, more than a few things about publicity at the time. In fact, it would use the car for almost any purposes to get a publicity shot. At a garage in London's West End, Sterling Musk drives in to inaugurate a device every motorist will welcome. A car cleaning installation that'll make a car spotless in three to five minutes. At full capacity, it can turn out one clean car every 15 seconds. Cost of the installation, over 25,000 pounds. And Sterling takes over his car as bright as a showroom model. To tell you the truth, we thought it looked clean to start with, but that's hardly the machine's fault. To me, if you look at the advertising, what we had here was a car that was developed from the D-type racing car. All that race heritage from Jaguar and quality build and small production. And they'd built a 150 mile an hour supercar. And it seemed from the advertising, which sort of featured lots of worthy copy, was an initial worry that people wouldn't pick up on this car unless you could justify for its existence. Supercars tend not to need any justification at all. 
um, if a brief of the E-Type lands on my desk with all its racing heritage, the only thing you'd have to put on it is some line that's, some line that's summed up the car and its race heritage and nothing else, probably a line of copy where you could actually buy it and how much it'd cost you, and that would be it. The E-Type was such a fast car so glamorous, so sexy, that I think there were quite a lot of people in the media the establishment who didn't trust it. It was a feeling that this was letting freedom go too far, rather like letting Lady Chatterley's lover be published. It had that kind of feel about it, the type And there were people that were saying, we're not going to have ordinary people driving around at these Ferrari Sterling Moss speeds. It was a dangerous symbol, a real symbol of the future that was coming. Here was a car capable of 150 miles an hour. Putting it into context, the average saloon car then had a maximum speed perhaps of half that, absolute maximum speed. And uh, we were running things like side valve Morrises and so on that wouldn't achieve 60 miles an hour. The Jaguar is a special breed of cat, more powerful than a leopard and really wild. Jaguar is a special breed of car. Available at local dealers everywhere, in every state of the Union. Jaguars, they're really wild. The Americans understood the E-Type instinctively. They saw it as a beautiful little high-speed toy. They knew it was a sexy little star, and they treated it like that. I think the British had a very confused attitude towards the E-Type. If you look at very early programs and films and publicity in Britain, you see this lovely, glamorous car being driven by people in flat caps and pipes and tweed jackets. I think the British thought it was um, when they actually on the road, they were back in a Triumph TR2 or an MGTC from you know, just the immediate post-war period. I think they misunderstood it. We chose Cannes in the south of France for our delivery. The skipper of the Quest saw his new Jaguar for the first time, thousands of miles from where he gave the original order to a Beverly Hills dealer. But everything was on schedule. The packet from Jaguar contained insurance papers and everything required to cross international borders. I suppose the E-Type in America could be described as the first real fashion accessory. It was a social statement. I mean, it wasn't very comfortable compared to sort of Cadillacs. Uh, it had no air conditioning compared to Cadillacs at the time. But what they did have was a little bit of Europe. You know, Europe was seen to have a certain amount of cachet, um, a certain amount of aplomb. Saint-Tropez, the jet set's new in spot, where every girl looks like Brigitte Bardot. The XKE stock 4.2 liter engine is a real hot iron. It really is great to drive your own Jaguar through Europe, and so easily arranged. You'd probably drive a Cadillac to work, for example, up and down to work. It was all very comfortable. You're cocooned in your Cadillac. But you get home at 5.30 and you have to go to a barbecue. What you tend to do is drive up in your E-Type and say, hi, I have arrived in my E-Type. Yes, you know about Europe. Let's have some sort of conversation. America made the E-Type. There's no doubt about it. The American press loved it. They were far more critical and intelligent than the British press at the time. They could see the car's virtues and vices, but they adored it, and so did the public that bought it. What are you giving your son for Christmas? Well, there's always a Jaguar. Disc brakes. And overhead camshafts, wire wheels. A really distinguished gift. When the E-Type hit the showrooms, it cost £2,000. At that price, it simply had no real competition. The only other cars that went as fast as it did were the Aston Martin DB4 at the time and one of the big Mercedes 300s. The point about those cars, of course, they're immensely expensive. The Aston cost just about twice as much as the E-Type and the Mercedes even more, whilst Ferraris, they cost the earth. They were like Rolex watch price compared to a Timex wristwatch. In terms of looks, of course, the Mercedes looked like a little light like cruiser, a little second mobile cruiser on the road, a very um, tough, menacing machine. 
and the Aston Martin, wonderful, handcrafted, very charming, but a bit of a carriage clock, an Edwardian carriage clock on the road. Seen the new models for 65? With a new 4.2 litre engine, the E-Type Jaguar has increased power and flexibility, but wears the same sleek body shell as previous models. for a trip in the surge of acceleration of a real man's motor car. One of the most satisfying things about driving an E-Type is the view right along the bonnet. It's like driving behind a real piece of sculpture. It is wonderful white on black instruments with their big needles sweeping round. I think what they do, they make you feel you're flying 50s jet fighter like a hawker hunter. It really does have that association. Top speed, 150 miles an hour. At night, it really is beautifully brought out. That's when the instruments glow, not like a modern car with brash green and orange lights, but very gently. And as you're driving along, the soft glow from the instruments, the purr from that big engine, and the very soft light from the headlamps, which actually aren't very good, gives you this experience of somehow driving both in the past and yet in some glorious frozen time, which you can't quite explain. It really is the essence of sports car driving. This sleek, bullet-shaped car is way out on its own. In setting this pace, Jaguars can look to the future with confidence, equipped with the knowledge that they have at their fingertips the resources and experience to remain permanently one leap ahead. Americans who so loved the E-Type, in the end were responsible for killing it off. Following the NADA report, cars had to be much safer, or perceived to be much safer, and exhaust controls had to be much tighter. So the two things happened to the E-Type. One, exhaust emission controls meant that the car went progressively slower, losing its fantastic top speed performance. And secondly, safety regulations, well, what sort of safety regulations? The fact Americans couldn't park their cars in car parks without bashing into the car next to them meant that they sprouted rubber bumpers. The cars got fatter and fatter, losing their wonderful looks. Well, in the early 70s, Jaguar thought, we must do something. They felt forced to do something radical, so they shoehorned a big new V12 engine onto the bonnet and beefed up the bodywork as well. The V12 was a fast car, but it was also the end of the line. The E-Type had lost its catwalk good looks. It had become a fat cat's adrenaline pump, overweight, out of date, and on its way out. The last E-Type left the production line in 1974. It marked the end of an era. I think the lasting feeling one has of E-Type, it was the ultimate expression of motoring freedom before all the legislation and laws came clamping down and made us drive safely and responsibly.